Hi everyone, how are you doing? So to cheer myself up today, because uh, I talked about in a recent book haul video how I've been feeling a bit glum about recent events, as I know many of us are. Um, so to cheer myself up, I talked about some new publications that I'm excited to read. And uh, today I want to talk about some classic books that I want to read over this extended period at home. Uh, and but. In addition to that, uh, to cheer myself up, I uh, dressed up a little bit today. And, uh, you know, to, to make this video, I want to at least wash my face. And But I thought, why not make a bit more of an effort and actually dress up a little bit, even though I have nowhere to go. And since I've been working from home, I don't need to do any video calls or anything. So, you know, I have found myself some afternoons uh, just wandering around in my pajamas and not having showered and uh, don't shower until much later in the afternoon. So, you know, I, I made a bit more of an effort today and, you know, it's made me feel good. It's uh, kept a bit of the, the usual routine um, that I've sort of fallen out of since having to, to stay at home. Uh, so recently, uh, I, the Everyman's Library, they published a list of 18 books that they would recommend people reading uh, over this period of, of crisis, and they all cite them as, as books uh, that we all like meant to read, but a lot of them we never got around to reading over a period of time. And uh, I'll put up the list of 18 books here so you can see it in full. And uh, they kindly uh, sent me a message and asked if I would be interested in reading some of these books. So I picked out 10 books that I've been wanting to read or reread, because um, I have read a couple of them before, but uh, you know, like many classics, they really benefit from rereading. So there's a couple that I, I do want to reread uh, over this period. And uh, yeah, and they're ones that I just never got around to, but I've heard about before and that sound really interesting. So I'm going to talk about all of these books, um, starting with Wilkie Collins' novel The Moonstone, which is meant to be a great classic detective novel. Uh, it was first published in 1868, and it was serialized in a magazine published by Charles Dickens uh, called All the year round. And uh, and so it concerns at the center of the story is a diamond, which is given to an 18 year old girl by her uncle um, who's come back from India. And he brought this diamond from India. And it's meant to be a very like sacred diamond. And, uh, and so a number of people from India traveled to to England um, to try to retrieve it. And uh, and when the she wears the diamond at a birthday party of hers, but over the course of that, that party, the, the diamond goes missing. And so the, the story concerns the mystery of what happened to that diamond and the diamond's origins. And it's told from a number of different people's perspectives. And yeah, it just sounds like a real good enthralling story. And uh, I've always meant to, to read uh, Wilkie Collins, but I've never read anything by him before. So uh, so this is one that I'm quite eager to get to and I think will be really entertaining over this period. And something I especially like about these Everyman's editions because they um, they come each come with an introduction in them uh, which I normally read after I've finished the novel because uh, because in introductions to classic novels they often give a lot of spoilers because uh, you're always meant to be rereading classics rather than just reading them. And so yeah, so I usually hold off reading the introduction till after I've read the novel. But um, in addition to introductions they give, uh, a lot of the, the books um, contain this chronology of events, which I find really interesting. So you can see a chronology of the author's life and major events and publications in that, that author's life, but then also worlds and historical events, which were occurring at the same time. So you can see how all these different events are, were happening at the same time. And then you can get, I think, a better sense of uh, the, the author's life and what influences might have gone into to writing these these different books. And yeah, I just find that a real interesting little addition um, in these particular editions of, of books. The Betrothed by Alessandro Menzoni. Uh, this is a classic Italian historical novel, which was first published in 1827, but then the author heavily revised uh, this novel over the subsequent decades.
decade. So a definitive version of it was published in around 1842, uh, I believe. And it's, um, it's set in the year 1628 in a region of northern Italy, which uh, during that time it was under Spanish rule. And uh, so it's, a, it's an examination of the politics and the working of the legal system um, during that time and injustices in the legal system during that time. And also um, some uh, themes about religion, um, how some priests um, were very corrupt uh, during that time, but then other priests um, practice religion very effectively and so were, were very helpful. And, uh, and the novel begins with a couple who want to get married, um, but then uh, some uh, thugs come to the village and they threaten the local priest who is going to marry them, um, telling them not to marry this, this couple. So it goes into the background of why they did that, um, but also, yeah, about the larger politics of the time. Parades End by Ford Maddox Ford. So this was first published between the years 1924 and 1928, and it chronicles the life life and journeys of a member of the English gentry uh, before, during, and after World War I. And Ford served as an officer um, during World War I, so it draws heavily on those experiences. But, but the novel isn't supposed to be so much about the experiences of war, but about the effects of uh, the psychological and social effects of war on individuals and society. And Ford um, said that his his sort of purpose of this novel, uh, this his very lofty purpose with this novel was to try to obviate all future wars. The Transylvanian Trilogy by Miklos Banfi. Uh, these are published in two volumes because the first novel in the trilogy is over 600 pages long, and then the next two novels um, between them extend over 770 pages long. So they appear in these these two volumes, and the the story concerns the decline of Hungarian nobility and the loss of Austria-Hungary as a nation in the years preceding World War I. And, uh, but the, the story is mainly concerned two cousins, uh, but it goes into multiple generations of this family. So something else I really like about this um, particular edition of the novel is that it includes a gene genealogy tree and, um, and some of the family sagas um, in these a series of Everyman editions have these family trees at the beginning of them. And I just get so excited when I see a family tree at the beginning of a novel because I love a good family saga. But in Brooks by Thomas Mann, this is another classic family saga I'd really like to get stuck into. So this was first published in the year 1901 and it chronicles the decline of a wealthy German merchant family over four generations in the 19th century. And this was Thomas Mann man's first novel that he published when he was only 26 years old and eventually made him very famous. Um, and it was one of the novels that was cited as helping him uh, win the Nobel Prize uh, when he eventually won that, that award. Uh, but the main theme of the novel is about the conflict between the business world and the world of artists. And uh, yeah, I think that sounds like a really interesting conflict to explore over the course of a family saga. Another depiction of multiple generations of a family are the novels which make up the Cairo trilogy by Naguib Mahfouz. Um, this is quite extensive. It's over 1,300 pages long between all three novels. Um, these were first published between 1956 and 1957. And, uh, but they, um, they chronicle the period in Egyptian history um, between 1919, um, which is the year the Egyptian revolution took place against the British colonizers. And then it ends shortly before the end of World War II in 1944. And uh, yeah, it traces multiple generations of this, this family and the changing um, social and political landscape in Cairo during that, that time. And really interestingly, the, um, the English translation of this only first appeared in the early 1990s, and that translation was overseen by Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis, and because at that time she was working at an editor at Doubleday, um, which is just a really interesting little tidbit of a fact. Lucky Purr by Henrik Pontopadin. This is a novel I've mentioned I've won to read 
read before. And the, the author, like Thomas Mann and Nagwa Mafuz, um, is also a Nobel Prize winner. Uh, so the, the story concerns the uh, Per from the, the title, um, who's a self-confident and gifted young man who breaks from his religious family and his social background in order to become a uh, engineer. Uh, but his family eventually forced him to, to give up this, this job. And uh, it's called Lucky in the title because I believe one of the major themes of the book is the tension between luck and happiness. And so the, the novel, I think, tries to de redefine the, the meaning and the, the consequences of success. Next are two novels which I have read before, but I'd really like to reread because I enjoyed them so much. And I'd be really interested to see how my thoughts and feelings about them have, have changed over time since I read them when I, I, was, I was quite young, probably in my teenage years or my early 20s. Uh, so the first is The Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky. And this was first published in serial form between the years 1879 and 1880. It's set in Russia during the 19th century and concerns many uh, ethical debates about uh, God and free will and morality. Uh, but it's also about uh, the changing Russian society um, over that period of time. And even though uh, it concerns these big theological debates, uh, I find his storytelling so enthralling and his characterization of the uh, the people he portrays is so riveting. And uh, so at the center of the story is this patriarch who has uh, sired three sons and possibly one illegitimate son as well, and how he takes no interest in their lives. And so it's about the tension of those relationships. And yeah, I just found the story so enthralling and his way of writing is just brilliant. And then we have Bleak House by Charles Dickens. Uh, this was first published in serial form between the years 1852 and 1853. So this novel has a really interesting structure in that it's told in alternating chapters between a third person omniscient uh, voice and then uh, the, the other side is narrated by Esther Summerson, one of the main characters of the novel. Um, and it's really interesting having Dickens, it's almost a like literary drag act where Dickens is impersonating this female voice, which, uh, you know, some critics say isn't all that convincing, but I think is really fun. So the main plot of the novel, like, I mean, many Doc Dickens big novels, you know, there's many characters, many subplots, but the main story of the novel concerns um, several competing wills and how these these wills are being contested um, within a court of justice. And uh, sort of so it's about who uh, gets this inheritance and in this great house. Um, but the sort of joke is that it's held in court so long and the legal fees are, are so extended that um, at the end of this, the, the trials, that, um, that the actual estate has been completely dissolved because it's all gone to these legal fees. So it's partly his critique of the, the legal system of that time. And, and I just enjoy his, his writing so much. So I'd really like to return to reading some Dickens. And then finally, I want to talk about a series which was on this Everyman's Library, a group of 18 books, but I don't have their editions of the book because I have this series which was uh, published as a box set about 10 years ago these editions were, were published um, because they were new translations of Remembrance of Things Past by Marcel Proust and um, and each book uh, was uh, translated by a different translator um, so I thought that was sort of interesting and I just love this this big box set which came out about them because you know it looks sort of big and important but of course um, they I never got around to reading all of these. I'd started reading the very first book in the series and I got about halfway through. Um, so Proust first published these books um, between the years 1913 and 1927. Um, so quite a period of time, but you know, they're very long books. And of course, they um, famously chronicle um, aristocratic experience um, in, in France during that time and the, the process of memory and, um, and 
and he details really interestingly, you know, how we recall these things from our, our past um, through sensory experience. And, uh, and so, yeah, I would like to get to reading these one day, but I know it'll consume me um, probably for many, many months. And I'm going to put this down now because it's quite heavy to, to lift up. So, so those are all the classic books I want to talk about. Let me know if you've read any of these, um, if you think they're ones that I should get to in particular, um, or if they're ones that you're really keen to read now as well, or if there's other classic books that you want to read during this this time of self-confinement. So I'll um, speak to you again soon. Uh, keep thinking good thoughts, and I uh, hope you're doing well and staying safe, and I'll speak to you again soon. Bye, everyone.